Would you look, look with me now in John chapter 13, this event where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper that we're about to come to. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. When he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him, he came to Simon Peter and said to him, who, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and that's why he said not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. You are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you example that you should also do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. Nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The grass withers and the flower fades. God's word abides forever. By his grace and mercy, may his word be preached for you. Please be seated. I had a great blessing last Friday. Well, in fact, I, honestly, I had a number of great blessings last Friday. Let me give you one. I had the privilege to go and and give a uh, talk uh, to the RTS banquet that was held here in um, Birmingham to support that wonderful seminary's ministry. It, I, I, and I want to support RTS because they're almost as good as Briar, uh, Birmingham Theological Seminary, and they're on their way. And uh, so it was great to be with them uh, and my friend Ligon. But I also, another professor of mine, teacher of mine, thankfully a colleague of mine and friend of mine, was there. You've heard his name many times because I quote him all the time, and I'm about to quote him today. <laughs> so, and I said to him, uh, I said, I'm so glad to see you, and it's uh, Dr. Sinclair Ferguson, and, and you've heard me refer to him. And uh, actually, we're in the Gospel of John, and my two favorite commentators on the Gospel of John are a Baptist uh, theologian by the name of A.W. Pink, and then also Dr. Ferguson, and the work that he has done in the Gospel of John is just extraordinary. So um, when I said to him, I said, I'm glad to see you for two reasons, Dr. Ferguson. Number one, I have got to get you. My people do not believe you exist. I keep giving them your name, but they don't know you exist. So would you, uh, let's work out a date to get you here. And we started to work right then. And I hope to be able to announce to you when Dr. Ferguson is going to be with us coming all the way from Dundee. He said, yes. He said, um, there are many that wonder if I live in this century when they hear me. And I said, yes, you do live in this century. And I can't wait for them to hear you here. The second thing is, I said, I always quote you and I I try to give, um, I try to always honor the quotes uh, or the, um, your effect in my life. And so this way I get to not just simply refer to you, I get to tell everybody I got to talk to you. And he said it was okay for me to borrow uh, one of these uh, points today, well, one of these insights today that I got from him some time ago in the Gospel of John. Let me get to it. Uh, the Gospel of John is very interesting. As you know, we've got the four Gospels, 
and they all give their own little insight. John, John already told you his purpose of writing this gospel. And by the way, it's probably the last gospel that was written of the four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when he, um, and when he, dec- when he wrote it, um, it was very clear that he took a different approach than the other writers who all have some kind of a chronological bent and covering the facts of the public life and ministry of Jesus from his birth to his baptism to his atoning death to his resurrection and his ascension. But John, while he covers the same period, John clearly has something else in mind. Now, he gives it away when four times in the Gospel of John he says this, these things I write so that you might believe in the name of the Son of God. He clearly had an evangelistic heart in the writing of this gospel. But what he doesn't declare, but what becomes evident when you read the gospel, is he has arranged it in order to highlight the encounters of Jesus with people. Not just like Matthew. All, five of his six sermons in the, uh, are recorded in Matthew uh, that are, that's in the gospels. Uh, No, he's more around the encounter. So he takes three chapters to talk about the first week of Jesus' public ministry and the encounters in John 1 through 3. Then in the rest of chapter 3, all the way through chapter 11, he gives encounter after encounter after encounter after encounter after encounter. And then when he gets to chapter 12, he comes to the last week of Jesus, and chapter 12 all the way through 21 deal with the last week of Jesus. And he, and he keeps showing things that happen, and no place does he uncover some details that the other writers of the gospel don't uncover than in the institution of the Lord's Supper in the upper room and some of the byplay that is taking place there. And John, John obviously wanted us to know something. John chapter 13, we could be in John chapter 13 every Lord's Supper until um, I go to be with Jesus or Jesus comes back first. It is so rich. I just want to give you one little insight on it as you come to the Lord's Supper today that he instituted at that time. And, and so, uh, and by the way, I, let me confess to you a little bit of a pastoral dilemma. I'm, I'm wanting to preach through First Peter, but I keep getting these interruptions, but the Lord's Supper is not an interruption. And I don't like to just stay in the text, because when we do the Lord's Supper, I like, I like for us and our worship team works hard that we all come to the table and everything, from our confessions to our hymns and to the sermon, everything brings our attention to the Lord's Supper. You see, that's the way the Reformed Church has always shown its importance of the Lord's Supper is not by simply adding it to every worship service, but by having a worship service with a season approach of focus that's upon it, that we can, that we can um, get all of it that God has designed for us. So I thought about going to this because I get to do two things here. I get, to, I get to focus on the Lord's Supper in this account where the Lord instituted. And secondly, I get to show you what this event, when the Lord's Supper was started, what it meant to Peter and how it affected what and how Peter wrote in 1 Peter. In other words, this event affected Peter so much it affected what he wrote. There are about five events that John talks about that show up in Peter's epistle that so impressed him. Now, not just five. I'm sure many events that Peter had in three years uh, experiencing with Jesus affected him. But there are five that very clearly he's referring to in the first epistle of Peter, and this is one of them. But let's take a look, a little bit closer look at it. Now, we can't go, I mean, I did this, oh, I wish I could just dive in here to the bottom of this, but we can't. I'm just going to pull one thing out for you. Did you notice four times it said, Jesus, uh, John writes that Jesus says, y'all don't understand. He says, you don't understand. He says, you will understand. And then he says, And then he says to them, not only do you not understand, but you will understand. He then says, do you understand now? And Peter and John hadn't gotten it yet. They will get it, and it will affect them, but they haven't gotten it yet. What is it they didn't understand? But I think the best way to see it 
is to first of all see what Jesus did understand. What did Jesus understand? The text tells you actually seven things that Jesus understood, that Jesus knew. I'm not going to give you all of them. Just let me get you thinking about him. He says, have you noticed it said that Jesus understood or knew what? That he had come from God. That he was going back to God. That his hour had come to, to depart. It says that he knew that God had given him all things and authority over all things. He knew that. And it also, that means he had authority to lay down his life and to take up his life. No man will take it from him. He will lay it down freely and then take it up again. That's called the resurrection. It also says that he knew he was, he, that he had come from God and was going back to God. And it's when that statement is made, Jesus did something. He rose from supper to do what? Come on, tell me, what, what did he rise from supper to do? Have y'all, how many of y'all have done that before? I mean, who in the world would get up in the middle of the supper and say, would y'all hold on just a minute before we go to the second course? I want to wash everybody's feet. That's, I mean, first of all, where it happened, you, you, know, something, you know something didn't happen. That should have already been done. Normally by a servant or a slave. Normally by a servant or a slave. But if not by one of them, somebody there ought to have. And, and after three years of doing a public ministry with Jesus, you would have thought one of the disciples would have said, hey, we're about to eat. Look, we're all supposed to have our feet washed. There's no servants here. Here, I'll do it. Jesus, can I wash your feet? I mean, we would kind of expect they'd be at that point. But no, they're not. Doesn't that kind of offend you? Well, wait, wait, wait. Let's see. How many of us every day are kneeling to wash Jesus' feet? You know, just a couple of days before, a woman had anointed his feet with oil and then dried it with her hair. They'd already seen that. Now, Nobody steps up to grab the towel in the basin. So in the middle of the supper, Jesus, knowing, now watch, don't forget this, knowing he had come from the Father and he was going back to the Father, rose from supper. Don't miss that. It's right in the text. It says, knowing he had come from the Father, knowing he was going back to the Father, he rose from supper. In other words, what he's about to do is attach to the reality of what he knows that he came from the Father and he's headed back to the Father. And then what does he do? He takes off his garments. He rises from his seat of honor. Now, why do we know it's a seat of honor? <laughs> well, we know it's a seat of honor because when he came in, there was a couple of guys arguing about who got the seats of honor next to him. Who were they? Well, they were the sons of... They were the sons of his aunt, who was his mother's sister. And that were, then those cousins were John and James, arguing about the seat of honor next to Jesus, who had the seat of honor at the table. He rises from the seat of honor. He takes aside the clothing that would have befitted the seat of honor. And then he clothes himself and girds himself and grabs the accoutrements of a servant, a towel and a basin, and then he kneels, and he washes the feet of each of the disciples, step by step by step. Disciples. By the way, you know what else he knows? You know what else he understands? Not only do they not understand, in a couple of hours they're all going to flee him. And there's one there who is going to betray him, Judas. He's washing his feet too. And there's another one that's going to deny him three times. And when he gets to that one, Peter, and says, I'm going to wash your feet, Peter. And Peter said, oh, no, you, you will. Now, look at the text. You will never wash my feet. Here's where I thank Dr. Ferguson for showing this out to me, and I did the work to confirm it. It's absolutely true. What he's literally saying is, 
when he says, I'm going to wash your feet, Peter. Peter says to him, no, not for eternity will you wash my feet. That's literally what it is. No, they translate it never. It's really, in the original, it's no, not for eternal, eternity will you wash. For the eternity of all eternities, you will not wash my feet. <laughs> That's what he tells him. Let me use our language. Our language is this. I'm going to wash your feet, Peter. Not in a million years are you going to wash my feet, Jesus. You will never wash my feet. Not in a million years will you wash my Of course, I didn't see Peter grabbing any towel and basins here. And then Jesus says, well, Peter, if I don't wash you, then you're not clean. And if you're not clean, then I have no part of you and you have no part of me. Well, eternity got real short. Oh, wash, head, hands, feet, whatever else you want to get, Jesus, get all of it. And he washes his feet. And then when he finishes, it says that he rose up. So he stood up, laid aside knelt down, rose up, and then put his clothes back on and took the seat of honor once again. Well, this is going to impact Peter. It's going to impact Peter so marvelously that Peter's going to, re you, this event's going to affect what you and I are going to study in First Peter in the coming weeks. For instance, Peter, out of this event, will say this to us, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you at the right time, right time. This will so affect him that in his arrogance that is yet to be totally humbled, it's beginning now. It's going to get humbled even more. But he will, he will want to put that lesson that he is learning. He will understand later how important this is. Let me, th something else. He is going to use the language of this. He's going to say, humble yourself, and not only humble yourself, clothe yourself with humility. He had watched Jesus clothe himself with the servant's, with the servant's materials. Then he says, and then he says, he has given us an example. The very word here, you see, Jesus, his death is not a, just an exemplary death, it's an atoning death, but his journey to the cross lays out for us how we who put our trust in him alone for salvation, how we live, not to be saved, but because we want to follow our Savior. And he said, now I'm telling you how you live with each other. You serve each other. You wash each other's feet. This is going to become so important that when a woman is supported for doing ministry in the church, one of her marks is she washes the disciples' feet. Therefore, she's put on the list. It becomes a hallmark. It becomes something that the, that the people of God are beginning to see, and it started with Jesus. And as Jesus led the example, that means like when you learned how to write and your teacher wrote out the words for you and you started tracing them. He said, I'm giving you how you trace my life. Not to be saved. This isn't what you do to be saved or to get good enough to be saved. You come to me. My atoning death pays it all for you. And then he says, but when you come to me, put your trust in me, and I'll give you everlasting life. And then when you follow me, live following me. Here's an example. You say, well, Harry, you don't know some of the people that are in this church. Oh, I know. I know. But you hadn't run into Judas yet. He washed his feet. He washed a man that was going to deny him three times, Peter, his feet. He washed the feet of all these disciples. Every single one of them are going to forsake him. You don't wash the disciples' feet because they deserve it. You wash the disciples' feet because they need it. And by God's grace, you know what you are by the grace of God. So I'm ready to kneel. I'm ready to lay aside my pride and kneel and love those whom I'm about to sit at the table with. And there's nothing so low, I cannot do it. And I want to do it. John will understand this. Years later, and this is probably the last, last gospel written. Years later, he'll understand this. And he's putting all, the Spirit of God led him to put all these in here. Do you know why? He got it. Jesus, knowing, now watch this, folks. Jesus, knowing he came from the Father, 
to save us from our sins. And then he went back to the Father, knowing that he rose from supper, laid aside his clothes, put on the clothes of a servant, grabbed the towel in the basin, went down on his knees to wash their feet, then stood up, rose up, put his clothes back on, sat down. Does that sound familiar? Jesus is giving you a living parable of his entire life and ministry for us. It's recorded for you in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Have this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he laid aside his privileges. He emptied himself, took upon himself the form, took upon himself the form of a man and humbled himself to be a bondservant of a man and humbled himself to death. Do you see it? Jesus rises up from the seat of honor, lays aside his clothing of honor, puts on the servant's apparel, and then kneels down. And then when he finishes, rises up, is reclothed, and ascends back to his position of authority. Jesus laid aside his privileges, knelt down to become a man, knelt down to become a bondservant, knelt down to die on the cross in our place, knelt further down into a tomb, then He rose up, clothed with the new body, enthroned in the heavens from where he came to bring us to be with himself. Right here, he gives this living, dramatic parable for them and for us to see and know we're saved in him and for us to see and know how saved people live. We humble ourselves. We take aside anything that would exalt us. And we kneel down with towels and basins. Welcome to the order of the towel. Welcome to the order of the basin. If you and I are Christians and followers of Christ. He knelt down that we would rise up. Maybe my most favorite statement is that moment that it says, John, after he has thought about this and understood it, says this, he loved his own and he loved them to the end. Did you hear it in your hymn? Hallelujah, what a savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping. He loves me. To the end. And because he loves us, that's the love we have to my spouse. You don't have to worry when you go to bed if I'm going to be here tomorrow. To our children, to our friends, to our fellow believers, because he is with me to the end. It is my end to be with you to the end. And to go with him who will never let me go all the way to the cross, which you now remember at this table. Also remember, on the way to the cross, he laid out the pattern for how we live for him and with each other. Let's kneel down that others can rise up. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the moments in your word. Would you come now as we, your people, behold our Savior, as we, your people, by faith feast upon him, would you come and minister to our hearts from the throne above? I pray in Jesus' name, amen.